Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But all oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king, and I shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace and i shall see him face to face and tell the story let us saved never negotiate out of grace. fear but let us never fear to negotiate someday when fades the golden I sun beneath the rosy tinted west my blessed lord will say well done and i will you and i have to look at this and understand this that the ballot is as powerful as the bullet him face to face and tell not the taking the step i will lose so much and i shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace and i shall see him face to face and tell the story saved by grace and i shall see him face to face and tell the story The sheer darkness of the dungeon so perfectly symbolized the period just before the underlying protest began. Many minds were trapped in error and superstition, while a church wielding persecuting power kept much of Europe in abject terror. It was a threat of being placed in one of these or worse that kept so many people from knowing the truth or exercising liberty of conscience. Yet today there is only a vague understanding of the one seminal act that took place 500 years ago, echoing throughout the world and paving the way for the freedoms we now enjoy. Like a vessel upon slow moving waters, the world had slowly drifted from the source of truth and life. There is a Latin expression, ad fontes, which means back to the sources. After hundreds of years of what seemed like an insatiable pursuit of knowledge, gross darkness still covered the then known world in what we now refer to as the Dark Ages. It was after the Dark Ages experience that the world was primed for Renaissance. The Renaissance was essentially a recovery of intellectual thought. It was energized and epitomized by a return to the study of the Greek and Latin classics. Similarly, the Protestant Reformation was ignited by a call back to the source of wisdom and knowledge. They felt a call back to the oldest source, the Hebrew text, Ad Fontes. Here in this dungeon, we come back to a place so often used as a means to extinguish the source of light and silence those who dared speak up. We have come back to do more than commemorate what took place 500 years ago. We have come to relight a torch and shine light on the event and its subsequent movement, which is now in danger of fading in a world of distractions caused by innovations cozy lifestyles and the very freedoms that the event itself produced. Could the Dark Ages ever return? And what actually happened 500 years ago? Why should you care? I'm Adam Ramden, and this is a journey back to the source that sparked the entire world with a light that none of us can afford to allow to die. Should you care? There are at least 95 reasons why you should.
What was at the heart of the Reformation? Was it a location? Was it Augsburg, Geneva, Wittenberg, or Edinburgh? Or was it something more than that? The focal point was that the Bible was written for and could be interpreted and understood by the common man. The result of this focus was a discovery of who the Antichrist was and who Jesus Christ was and that he was freely accessible to all. It was during the Reformation that men like Martin Luther identified whom he thought was the Antichrist, that religious power that sought to usurp the prerogatives of God himself using the might of the state. It was Luther who stated, I feel much freer now that I am certain that the Pope is the Antichrist. In fact, it was a belief commonly held by all the reformers of that day. As divine providence would have it, the Bible, the source of all light, also identified the true Christ. Luther and other reformers believed the scriptures identified the Roman church as the Antichrist, a power that through a union with the civil power of the state would control the world. Because of the Antichrist's dark influence, the people could not find the source that lit the way to access God. They depended instead on trinkets, statues, and weak, fallible men. But all can come to the producer of light and wisdom and knowledge. All are invited to come freely to the source. Unfortunately, the idea that works were required or that you needed man to either interpret the scriptures or even to forgive sin were some of the darkest ideas that dominated the Christian faith at the time. It seemed that nothing could change the course of these practices until... On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle Cathedral, oblivious of the ramifications of his actions. Luther was 34 and throughout the rest of his life he would be the engine that drove the Reformation, inspiring countless generations to come. At the time, Luther was responding to John Tetzel, who was traveling through Germany selling indulgences, essentially a fast ticket to heaven, in order to fund the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Based on Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, Luther believed in salvation through faith by grace, while the papacy believed that salvation required some action on our behalf, which in this case was the purchasing of indulgences. Rather than a gift of grace, as taught in the scriptures, salvation was a financial investment. But the Bible teaches that we're saved by the free gift of grace, which is attained by faith alone. The only cost is believing and accepting the gift. The teaching that salvation was free and could not be purchased was a radical idea that threatened the church's economy. Today, the Catholic Church no longer sells indulgences and professes to believe in salvation by faith. However, it is still based on a faith in our works rather than a faith in God. In 1999, the Catholic Church signed a joint declaration with the Lutheran Church, which was hailed by many as a step in bridging the divide and reaching a consensus on justification. However, the Catholic Church still affirmed the view of the Council of Trent on justification, which declared upholding justification by faith alone as anathema. The Roman Catholic Church's basic view of salvation is still dependent on the mediation of the church, the distribution of grace by means of the sacraments, the intercession of the saints, and purgatory even after the joint declaration of 1999. Jesus prayed in John 17 that his people may be one as he and the Father are one. In the Bible at the end of time, it says there will be one flock and one shepherd. However, truth must never be sacrificed for unity and peace cannot be attained through compromise. Today, unity is often secured through shallow statements and a minimization of historical events and a reinterpretation of those same events to suit current agendas. Martin Luther was not a saint 
nor were his beliefs completely without error, but his understanding and conviction that the Bible could be understood by the common man and that salvation was available through direct communion between the believer and Jesus Christ still stands today. The issues that gave birth to the Reformation 500 years ago are still relevant to the church at large today. While we should welcome all opportunities for clarification and cooperation, we should also affirm, as did the reformers, that the Bible is our final authority and that salvation is through faith alone. Many would agree that during times of confusion and oppression, challenging the status quo is needed. Martin Luther caused a major disruption and changed the trajectory of history. Arguably, because of this, he is one of the most important and popular figures of the 16th century. But who is this man who altered the course of history in such a dramatic fashion? We went to his hometown to find out. There are certain events that have such significance that they are referred to as turning points of history. The life of Martin Luther would have such significance that it deserves to be thus classified. But sometimes big things come in small packages and sometimes major world events have humble beginnings. On the 10th of November, 1483, in the little town of Eisleben, Saxony, Germany, Martin Luther was born here in this house. As with the early apostles, Luther did not come from the wealthy, well-to-do classes, but from the ranks of poverty. Here in his home, we can see evidence of his family's humble beginnings. They were poor, but honest, industrious, and never dreamt that their son would grow up to become a famous figure in the history of the world. His father was a miner, working long hours to provide the means for Luther's education, hoping that he would one day become a lawyer. In spite of his father's hard work, the family was so poor that Luther would sometimes have to sing from door to door on the way to school in order to obtain food. As well as being the town that Luther was born in, Eisleben is also the town where Luther was baptized, here in the church of St. Peter and Paul. It's also the town where he preached his last sermon in the church of St. Andrew, and it's here in this town where he lived before passing away. Martin Luther enrolled in the University of Erfurt right here in the building behind me and diligently applied himself to his study. One day, he was in the university library and found a copy of the Latin Bible. He had never seen a Bible before, being ignorant of its very existence. He had heard portions read in worship, but had never seen the whole Bible. And now, for the first time in his life, he gazed upon it as a whole. Because Luther had only heard portions of the Bible read at worship, he had not seen how much God cares for man, God's love for the sinner, how a man can be completely forgiven and wash away his past life through baptism, how the study of God's word can lead to a personal relationship with God as a friend. Luther graduated with a BA in 1502, and three years later, in 1505, he attended this Augustinian monastery. His father was very disappointed in him, and this put strain on their relationship, and it was two years before father and son would be reconciled to each other again. It was an earnest desire to be free from sin and to find peace with God that led Luther to seek the monastic life. While here in the monastery, he would often spend time reading and studying God's Word. He had found a Bible chained to the convent wall, and it was to there that he would often spend time. Luther was a very pious monk, and if salvation could be obtained through his works, then he would most certainly have been entitled to it. Luther was the type of person that would have killed himself through fast, penances and abstinences had the gospel not been brought to his understanding. God brought a friend and helper in a man named Staupitz. 
He was a professor of religion at the University of Wittenberg and was the vicar general of the monastic order to which Luther belonged. Their history was a very long one, but the most important thing about their relationship was that Staupitz soon realized that Luther, in his desire to serve God fully, was not truly living a gospel-centered life. God used this faithful friend to set him on the right course with a clearer understanding of the gospel. Martin Luther was immersed deeply in the theological teachings of his day, yet he still needed to be taught what a gospel-centered life is. The same may be said of many people today. To know and understand the simplicity of embracing the power of God, to save a man, woman or child out of the worst circumstances, to pronounce them clean and forgiven and to set them on a whole new path, to rescue them from their ways is a gospel-centered life. No tricks, no works required, just faith in the power of God through Christ. Martin Luther has been quoted saying, I am more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. I have within me the great Pope, self. Luther's humble beginnings, which appeared as a little light in a very large and dark world, would soon shine bright as the sun as an unseen hand moved this young Catholic monk on a journey that not even he fully understood. His next stop, a city so great that it reigned as a persecuting power for over a thousand years where religion controlled the state. It was in fact the superpower of the world, the eternal city, Rome. After leaving the monastery, Luther was called to the University of Wittenberg to teach. While here in Wittenberg, he applied himself to the study of the scriptures in their original tongues and began to lecture on the Bible, in particular, the Psalms, the Epistles and the Gospels. His friend Staupitz urged him to ascend the pulpit and preach. This was something he was hesitant to do, feeling unworthy of the task. But following a long struggle and with encouragement from his friends, he finally agreed. Luther was an eloquent speaker, captivating his hearers with the clarity and power with which he spoke. Before long, his fame as a speaker was growing, both amongst the university students and the general public. Every great revival in history has been founded on great preaching, and the German Reformation was to be no different. A dispute arose between seven of the local convents and their vicar general, and it wasn't long before the future reformer was sent on his way to Rome to settle the quarrel. On his way there, he noticed some things. Staying at the monasteries, he noted the wealth, magnificence and sheer luxury that was there. He contrasted this with the life of self-denial that he himself had grown accustomed to living. The Pope at that time was Pope Julius II, and Luther thought that Rome was, as it were, the very gate of heaven itself. Indeed, as he approached Rome, he lay prostrate on the ground and said, Holy Rome, I salute thee. As he entered the city and visited the churches and saw the priests and monks, he was filled with both shock and horror. He saw amongst the clergy unashamed and open sin. He heard the indecent jokes, swearing, and he struggled to find some peace and solace. No one can imagine, he said, what type of sins are committed in Rome. They have to be seen or heard to be believed. They are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, then Rome is built over it. It is an abyss whence issues every kind of sin. By a recent decree, an indulgence was promised to all those who would ascend Pilate's staircase on their knees. It was believed that the staircase in Rome was mysteriously transported there during the night and was the very staircase that Jesus ascended on the night when he was condemned. One day, Luther was devoutly climbing these steps when a voice came to him like thunder, the just shall live by faith. He got up from his knees, 
walked away, never to be the same again. Upon returning from Rome, Luther preached his famous sermon entitled, The Just Shall Live by Faith, here in the St. Mary's Town Church. This was a question that lay heavy on Luther's mind and one which he wrestled with over and over again. Indeed, the German Reformation hinged on the question, how can a man be just in the sight of God? It's a question that many people still wrestle with today. At this point in his life, Luther had no plans to start his own church or movement and still saw himself as a loyal son of the church. But in making the commitment to put the Bible above the words of the councils or popes, he set himself on a course that would ultimately lead far away from Rome. As Martin Luther was experiencing his own personal recovery of truth and light, and consequently being positioned to be the spark that would unleash freedom throughout the world, something came directly in Luther's path that threatened to quench the fire. But God has always placed protection around his truth and light. Can you imagine forgiveness for sale? As Luther was grappling with the idea of how a man can be just in the sight of God, a practice and a very lucrative one at that was making its way throughout Germany. Indulgences, the selling of salvation. Now things would really begin to heat up. From 1512 to 1517, Martin Luther's life had been engaged mainly in preaching and teaching, but it was destined to change forever when John Tetzel came to town. The Pope at that time was Pope Leo X, as Pope Julius II had died about four years previous. He was eager to proceed with the erection of the great church of St. Peter, which his predecessor had left unfinished. In order to raise funds to complete the church, rigorous methods of fundraising needed to be resorted to, and so the Pope issued indulgences with that in mind. He decided not to resort to this tactic in Spain, France and England, but in Germany the responsibility for selling the indulgences was given to a salesman by the name of Tetzel. As Tetzel came into a town, a messenger would go before him proclaiming the grace of God and of the Holy Father is at your gates. People welcomed this false preacher as he proposed a rather easy way to paradise. He promised to pardon all the sins which the purchaser would commit from here on out and that not even repentance was necessary. In addition to this, he promised that the indulgences had the power to forgive not only the living but also the dead as well. Tetzel's famous quote was, as soon as the money clinks against the bottom of the chest, the soul escapes purgatory and flies to heaven. These type of messages produced two responses. Firstly, a band of scoffers who wondered why, if the Pope had the power to release people from purgatory, he didn't do it as a matter of charity. And secondly, a stronger and deeper opposition was people who asked what the Bible said about forgiveness. Luther was, at this time, still a priest of the church and still had to hear people's confessions. A problem arose when some of his parishioners produced Tetzel's pardon for their sins and Luther refused to accept them, declaring them nothing but a big fraud. Around this time also, Luther preached a powerful sermon entitled Indulgences and the Grace of God, and he also sent a detailed protest to the archbishop and local bishop. It was amidst these events that on the festival of all saints, Luther posted on the university church door right here behind me, his 95 theses or doctrinal statements about this debated question. This event was a turning point and the publication of the 95 theses created a great deal of excitement amongst the German people. They were read and reread and repeated far and wide. Luther was in awe at what he had done, opposed the mightiest power on earth, 
and it was not long before he was summoned by Rome to appear to answer for his teachings. Never before had one man who had such a huge following of people already opposed Rome on his own. At this time, the people were sick of the corruption of the church and many people were thankful that someone was saying something about it, though not everyone was bold enough to take a stand with him at the time. Under the threat of having your freedoms taken and cast into the darkness of such a place as this, would you have stood with Luther? What if the prosecuting and persecuting power of your nation sought to control you and the freedoms you now enjoy? Would you seek the light and stand for the truth? Without the strong convictions of Luther, as he went against and contrary to the might of Rome, would nations have freedom of religion today? The freedom to disagree with the state and protest? Can you imagine how you and your family would be tested had that persecuting power never been challenged? Truly, Luther was resolute in his convictions, but they would be severely tested. Soon after he posted his 95 Theses in Wittenberg, Luther was summoned to appear in Rome to answer a charge of heresy. His friends were filled with dread. They knew the danger that threatened him in that city. People remember John Huss a century before, how he had been promised a safe passage and fair treatment, but he had been burned at the stake. Elector Frederick of Saxony, one of the seven German princes, demanded that the trial be held within the boundaries of his territory. The Pope's legate was to hear the trial on his behalf, but before the trial could begin, the legate was charged to prosecute and constrain without delay, and to banish, curse, and excommunicate all of whatever rank in church or state who would not seize Luther and his adherents. Here is displayed the true spirit of Luther's foes, not a trace of justice to be found. It was around this time that a dear friend of Luther would come to his aid and support, Philip Melanchthon. He was younger than Luther and was a learned scholar. His carefulness, gentleness and exactness would serve as a complement to Luther's courage and energy. Augsburg had been set as the place of the trial, and whilst Luther was told not to attend by many of his friends who feared for his life, he was resolute about attending and made his way to Augsburg. At this point, Luther had not received an assurance of a safe passage, and his foes hoped that he would appear without one, but this he refused to do. The legate was at first very friendly in his exchanges with Luther, but he misjudged his determination and the strength of his convictions. Luther protested that he was being asked to retract without first being shown his error. Every response that he gave, he showed clearly how it could be backed up with the Bible. But the legate's response was always a heated response with the words, retract, retract. Realizing that this exchange was futile, Luther asked to present his findings in writing, which he did the next day. He gave it to the legate and he threw them aside straight away. Luther then met this proud man on his own grounds, the traditions and teachings of the church, showing how his assumptions were wrong. The trial wasn't really going anywhere though, and Luther soon retreated with his friends. They had tried to bully Luther by their threats, but this had not worked. Luther's teachings and writings were spreading across Germany like wildfire and eventually Rome resorted to a bull of excommunication. Luther was condemned along with his adherents and they were given 60 days to either recant or be excommunicated. Normally this would strike fear into the heart of anyone but not Luther. He gathered around him a group of doctors, students and citizens of Wittenberg and under a tree near this very spot, he publicly burned the Pope's bull of excommunication and the canon laws. Rome produced another bull of excommunication against him, declaring his final separation from Rome, saying he was accursed of heaven 
and condemning anyone who adhere to any of his doctrines. Truly it can be said of Luther, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. While the forms of opposition to the truth change and how open they are over time, the same antagonism exists and will be manifested to God's people until the end of time. Yes, antagonism still exists and we will see it more in our time. In Luther's day, the darkness perpetuated by this persecuting power was no match for one man who returned to the greatest and brightest source of truth. that would shine brighter and brighter progressively as time went on. It would be his source and shield of defense. Luther had been called to trial and he arrived in Worms on the 15th of April, 1521, and he caused quite a stir. People were dying to see him and his place of residence was constantly full of people who wanted to spend a few moments with this brave man who was willing to take on the whole church all on his own. Luther's very appearance was a victory in itself for to be condemned and excommunicated and then be given a voice in trial undermines the authority of the one who excommunicated him. It must be noted that Luther at this stage of his life and ministry still had no intention of breaking away from the church. He commented that nothing could be gained through schism and he hoped to reform the church from within. One of the key principles of the Reformation that Luther accepted and held on to resolutely was that the Bible was the foundation of all Christian belief and practice. Thus, when accused of error and heresy, he simply asked his accusers to show him from the Bible where his error was. As he was about to enter the room, a few people spoke words of encouragement to him, in particular one army general who told him that he was about to make a more noble stand than he and any of his captains had made on the battlefield. He told them that if his cause was just, and he was sure of it, to go forward in the fear of God. At the trial, Luther was asked two things. Firstly, were the books his? And secondly, whether he would retract his opinions. Luther responded and said that the books were his, but he asked for some time in order to craft his response as to whether he would retract or not. This convinced the assembly that he was not acting from impulse and would later give further weight to his answers. The next day when Luther responded, he divided his writings into three different sections. In the first section, he dealt with faith and works, and even his enemies declared that these were not only harmless, but also beneficial. In the second class of books, he denounced the corruptions of the papacy, and to revoke these would strengthen the tyranny of Rome. And in the third class of books, he denounced those who defended these very evils. While Luther admitted that perhaps he could have been a little bit less harsh in his responses, even these he was not willing to retract. At this point, Luther had spoke only in German, and he was now asked to give his response in Latin. Despite being tired, he was able to do this, and it gave further weight to his response as everyone in the chamber heard what he said for the second time. The spokesman now pushed him for an answer, asking him the question, will you or will you not retract? Standing here on this very spot, Luther gave a response that has become famous over the centuries. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason. For I cannot accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have often contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. So God help me, amen. The assembly stood in amazement, 
speechless at what they had just seen and heard. He was again asked if he would retract, to which he responded, may God be my helper, for I can retract nothing. The courage that Luther spoke with at this trial has inspired many people since then to stand for God in the face of opposition and against the odds. In Mark 13 verse 9, the Bible tells us that one day we may have to stand before kings and rulers. May we be faithful to God that if we have to stand, we would do so with boldness and unflinching courage in the face of trial. Following the Diet of Worms, Luther was still under a lot of pressure to recant and compromise in his positions with Rome. He was even threatened with banishment, but he would not be moved. He even said he would give up assurance of a safe conduct, but never his positions on the Word of God. As Luther left Worms and travelled across the country, he was warmly received by the German people. But there were still many people who wanted to kill Luther and the Emperor himself said that as soon as the assurance of his safe conduct should expire, that measures should be taken to end Luther's work. The Elector of Saxony, Frederick, devised a plan with some of Luther's friends to capture him and keep him hidden for some time. He was taken here to Wartburg Castle, a place kept so secret that even the Elector Frederick did not know that he was being kept here. Luther's enemies rejoiced, thinking that he had been defeated, but this time for Luther would prove to be a double blessing. Not only did it withdraw him from the heat of the battle, but it also took him away from the public praise and adulation, something that can spiritually maim even the strongest of men. It was here in this room that Luther stayed during his time here at the castle. Like the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation as a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, while Luther was hiding here in this castle, he translated into German the New Testament. He would translate the Old Testament later, after his return to Wittenberg. Another challenge to the Reformation would now appear on the horizon. In Luther's absence, other reformers had arisen whose message was different to that of Luther and it was drawing away a lot of people and dividing the movement. In particular, some people thought that it was acceptable to use violence as a means to abolish the mass and to rise up against the oppressors. Thomas Munzer was a leader of this movement. This news was relayed to Luther and he felt a deep burden for his people back in Wittenberg as he thought of them as a shepherd thinks of their sheep. Despite having no assurance of a safe conduct, he left Wartburg Castle and headed for Wittenberg. Luther's return caused a great stir and the church filled at the first opportunity to hear him speak. Luther stood up and reaffirmed that the mass was a bad thing and ought to be abolished, but that no one should be torn from it by force. It was not their job to force the conscience of anyone, no matter how strong they felt about the matter. Luther was able to check this uprising for a while, but it would arise later on with devastating results when Thomas Munzer himself was killed. Every time there is a true revival, Satan brings a false one along. Even so, at the end of time, there's going to be a true revival of godliness and then there's going to be a false revival as well. May we be faithful to God that we will be part of the true revival that will take place at the end of time. In 1529, the second Diet of Spires convened right here. The first was in 1526, which gave each state full liberty in religious affairs. In 1529, all the German princes gathered here, along with representatives of the church. The church's desire was to crush out the heresy of the Reformation, first by peaceable means, but using full force if needed. One thing that was proposed was a halt on conversion. The states that sided with the Reformation would stay that way, and the ones that did not would stay as they were. If this edict was to be enforced, 
then the Reformation could not be extended where it was not yet known. Neither could it be established on a solid foundation where it had started. The key issue at stake was liberty of conscience. As they met to discuss what they would do with this proposal, key issues for the world lay on the table. Did Rome have the right to coerce conscience and forbid free inquiry? As they looked back at the recent history and saw the great sacrifice that many had made to get to this point, and they contrasted this with the major restriction on civil liberties that was proposed, the princes said, let us reject this decree. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. They saw the state's role was to protect liberty of conscience and that this was also the limit of its role in religious matters. In their response, they used the word protest. And it's from here where we get the term Protestantism today. But it's important for us to understand the background of that term to know what a Protestant truly is. They said that the principles contained in this protest contain the essence of Protestantism. They opposed the abuse of man in two areas of faith. Firstly, the intrusion of the civil magistrate and secondly, the arbitrary authority of the church. Instead of this, Protestantism puts the power of the conscience above the civil magistrate and the authority of God's word over the visible church. They rejected civil power in divine things, encouraging people as in the book of Acts to obey God rather than men. They understood that it was the role of the state to protect civil liberties and not to prescribe religious actions to the masses. In our day and age, there is a wide departure from this great Protestant principle, the Bible and the Bible only as the rule of faith and duty. There is a need for us to have the same unswerving adherence to the Word of God as was manifested at this crisis of the Reformation. Had these princes buckled under pressure and sought to enjoy the success they had achieved thus far in order to secure favor with the authorities, the movement would have been destroyed. They understood that there were greater issues at hand and believers around the world since that time have enjoyed the benefits of their resolute stand. While the name of Martin Luther is well known throughout the world and the name of these princes is much less known, their place in history is nonetheless vital. Have we accepted that the protest is over while our freedoms are being carefully and often imperceptibly chipped away? Perhaps we're already wandering in the darkness and don't even realize it. So, the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here, because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? The protest is over.